Hello and welcome into another episode of Another Carolina Podcast. I'm your host, Pearson Fowler. You can catch me weekdays from 12 to 1 on the home of the Gamecocks, 107.5 The Game. And with me, as always, to break down, I don't know, a reasonably eventful spring so far for South Carolina football. Wes Mitchell just got a chance to talk to John Scott Jr., the third, the South Carolina defensive line coach. We'll get to hear a little bit uh, from him in just a second. I want to remind you, as always, though, if you like what you hear and you want to hear more of this, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with your friends so that we can keep doing this. We do this for y'all. Let us know. Give us feedback. If you think that we're stupid, let us know that, too. You know, All feedback is good feedback in my book. Maybe Wes and Chris don't take it as well as I do, but uh, let I'm us know okay what you think. That, rate, review, listening. subscribe. Yeah, exactly, and listen. Uh, Wes, we'll get started with you because, like I said, you got the first chance to hear from John Scott, Jr., the third, the new defensive line coach for South Carolina. It's the first time he's gotten a chance to speak, and it's the last time until we get to hear him talk again in the fall. So what were your impressions of him? Yeah, you know, I think my first thought was I could see why Muschamp was so impressed with this guy. You know, we heard that he was very impressive during the interview process, and there were really no former ties directly to Will Muschamp, you know, when they hired him. You know, sometimes, um, especially in, in the coaching world, there are direct connections. And, you know, with, with John Scott, there were some sort of, uh, like, ancillary connections, I guess, but not direct connections. And, you know, I think when you hear him talk, um, very just personable guy, um, introduced himself to everybody, uh, looked everybody in the eye, and I, I think tried to um, learn their names and stuff like that. And um, polite guy, and I think you probably heard, heard that quite a bit, is that he's just an overall nice guy, easy to get along with, which I think goes a long way in recruiting. Um and uh, then just uh, very knowledgeable, um, you know, explained a lot of things. To me, I, I listen to, to coaches and how well do they explain things just when they're talking to people who sometimes don't, us as media, don't know exactly what all they're talking about at, at times when they start getting uh, technically detailed. Which so, I love, by the way. Yeah. and, and you, I think it's a cool glimpse into the way they think. Will Muschamp, every once in a while, someone will ask him a question in a post-game press conference. He's in a coach mode. Yeah and, yeah, and I love it. And part of me thinks he's doing it just to show off or just to be like, half of you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I would like to think that it's just a really candid moment of you know him going into like Rain Man mode. And I, I one of my favorite ones is when he was asked about defending the Hail Mary, I think, two, three years ago. And he, he went all into every possible way you could try to defend the Hail Mary um, and, and just went into every detail that, that let's be honest, none of us really think about it to that detail. Mm-hmm. Um, but we so, want to know, you know? Yeah, we, don't, I, we don't always want just like the road answers. It's, it's kind of cool. Like we, at least I, have always appreciated uh, how candid Frank Martin is in press conferences and his isn't even necessarily always into the X's and O's, but I just, I don't know, I like to get into the minds of these guys, so I do appreciate those those more candid moments. Well, and my, to, for me, the, the two best or the two things I look for when I'm interviewing a coach or going to a media thing is a are they just entertaining are they funny uh which Chris got to uh go to the Eric Wolford one earlier this week which um Wolfie don't care basically you know, highly like he, entertaining yeah. he yeah. he will say what real honey badger yeah he will say whatever is on his mind and then I think with you know with John Scott the, the other thing that I like in a coach or about my job is like you're talking about Pearson is if I learn something when they speak I remember, like Ellis Johnson, when he was a defensive coordinator here. Every time Ellis Johnson spoke, I feel like you would you would learn something new um, about football. So, you know, I, I appreciate that when when you sort of feel like you learn something, and you know, I, I got that impression uh, from John Scott today. We'll let you hear a little bit of John Scott's audio in just a second. You can go on Gamecock Central and watch the full thing. Wes went and got that audio for y'all this morning. We'll let you hear a couple minutes here in just a second. But wanted to. I guess just clarify something, because you mentioned several times the adjective that kept coming up was some variant of nice, mm-hmm. polite. You know, obviously you want someone that's polite, well-mannered, especially for recruiting, but that's never anything that I feel like you necessarily look for in a football coach. I feel like you want someone that's going to be like, rah, 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 you know? And that, that's not like, <laughs> like I'm imagining that. I was just like, hey, guys, how's it going? Hey, you know what? You didn't make that tackle, but that's all right. You'll get <laughs> him next time. And that's like antithetical to modern football coaches in my mind. Well, and I'm I'm more talking about just as far as being able to connect with guys and and on the recruiting process and and one thing I I think we're going to see play out with John Scott is that he's never really been at a place where he's had access to the type of players he's probably going to have access to here. Um, you know, not certainly that South Carolina is in Alabama or you know a school like that, but I think at his position group specifically, the state of South Carolina. 
And then if you want to venture out a little bit more, state of North Carolina, state of Georgia, you're going to find all the defensive linemen you need in this general vicinity. So if you have a guy who can connect with these kids and has um, connections to the area, um, like I said, he's from Greer, South Carolina. Um, he said he grew up going to – when he was a teenager, he would drive to Columbia to watch Hootie and the Blowfish. Um, played at williams Price Stadium in a state championship game when he was at Greer. Um, this guy has – Long-standing connections to the state. Has Did you ask him if he's going to see Hootie when they're going to be here the week of the Alabama game? We did not. Okay. Uh, this thing went long, so you know by the end you're kind of at least I when a guy's been standing there answering questions for like 25, 30 minutes, you know even if there's more stuff you can ask, I kind of start to be like, all right, let's you know let's let him get out of here. I guess maybe that's I just, just go me. until Fink stops me, but yeah, um, but but no, nobody asked about Hootie. I'm sure no, that's Alabama week, so there's no way. Anybody will be at Hootie. Go to the Wednesday it. night concert. Yeah. Get a little uh, R&R, nope. take your mind off of things so, before you get back into the heart of the game plan. That would be interesting. They have, what, a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? No. Yeah, yeah Definitely I still not Friday. The coaches Probably not there. Thursday. Maybe the Wednesday, though. If it was off week, they'd all be there. Yeah, but I don't I don't know if that would be a good look, you know? As long as Maybe nobody finds out, no problem. Well, yeah. I think everybody's going <laughs> to find out. I think going to find out. Um, but no, so um, I don't even remember what you asked me. Hopefully I answered well, it. Well, yeah, I think you did. Serious question, though, because I, I've done the Dan Patrick thing now enough that I can't actually remember, and I've probably confused some of our listeners, and I'm sorry about that. Is he junior or the third? He's the third. John Scott the third. No, he's no. John Scott Jr. He's, he's John Scott Jr.? He's junior. Okay. It, yes, 100% junior. John Scott, Scott Jr. Yes. All right, so here is a little bit of John Scott Jr. the third talking to collective <laughs> media after spring practice today. How did the process go of you getting here? When did Will contact you, and, and, and how quick, quickly did that process go? Well, you know, um, I don't remember the exact dates. I just remember it was around the time of the uh, Georgia uh, State High School Championships, okay. and um, that's kind of when everything started happening. And, um, you know, it wasn't uh, super fast. It was, you know, just a little bit of contact, and then, th- then things sped up after the interview, uh, obviously. But, it, you know, it was over the course of a few weeks. Uh, before I was finally able to get here. What makes a Will Muschamp practice different in your eyes? Well, the thing I love about it, uh, to me, it's, it's it's old school. It's what I'm used to. Uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of what we did at Georgia Southern with Jeff Monken, who's the head coach at Army. Just, you know, the uh, physicality that we're able to get in practice with the half line, the six on four, uh, you know, I think that's great, you know, and, you know, you look at the best football teams that are physical up front, they're able to run the football, and so I like that because as a, as a defensive uh, line coach, the more you can get a playing double teams and chip blocks and getting uh, zone and reach and all that kind of stuff, I think the, matter, the better it makes your football team and the better and the tougher it makes your football team on both sides. So I, I love that type. You're not going to hear me complain at all. You know, I like what we do. What was your first impression of seeing the group that you'll get to coach here? Um, you know, I, I'm pretty excited about what we have. You know, obviously, you know, we have some, some guys that are really, really going to be big contributors not out there right now, but that's okay. It's a great opportunity for some of the younger guys to get more quality reps, which, you know, in this league, you know, <laughs> Uh, you better have some depth, you know, because I say all the time it's the AFC, the NFC, and the SEC. So you better have some depth and you better have some guys that can go in. You know, you need to be six or seven deep, and that's the thing this spring is allowing us to do with some of the guys we'll be counting on in the fall that are out. We're able to develop some quality depth behind that. Who is in the, the group you've specifically been working on, working with in these first five practices? Um, you know, right now um, we got um, Kobe Smith, uh, Jabari Ellis, Rick Sandage. Uh, uh, we got Gentry. Uh, Zach Pickens has been out there some. I mean, that's kind of really the group right now uh, as we're, you know, we're getting started and moving forward. Devontae Davis uh, has been out there as well. So that's kind of the nucleus of guys we got right now. And, you know, hopefully after spring break, you know, we may be able to add another guy or two to the group. But that's that's kind of what we've been working with. Is there, is there something nice about work, maybe working with a little bit of a smaller group like that, being able to give them a little more one-on-one attention? Um, yeah, you know, it, it you know it's very similar to the setup we had my last year at Arkansas, where I had the, the inside guys and uh, Coach Caldwell had the DEN. So, you know, that that helps. You know, you're able to get some quality uh, reps, and I think more than anything else, you're able to really specialize on the, the blocking schemes that, and, and situations that the tackles are going to see, whereas out there uh, playing defensive end, the blocking schemes are a little bit different. Uh, the techniques and responsibilities are a little bit different. So, yeah, you're right. You do get to isolate more on what the tackles will see. What about Zach's um, 
characteristics and, and the way that he plays make him a candidate to be not just a, an early contributor for you, but somebody who can play both inside and outside? Well, the thing I, I really like about Zach, you know, and, and the limited basis he's been able to be out there is, you know, number one, it's can't coach that body. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a big kid. He's got already got a powerful lower body. Uh, he's got long arms, so he already has the frame. And, you know, he, he's able to do things naturally that, you know, really good football players are able to do, you know, naturally with the limited amount of reps and practice that he's had, he's able to do some things. So I'm very excited to see, you know, just like we say all freshmen, they got to get in there and get their nose bloody a little bit and, you know, uh, feel it from SEC linemen. But, you know, so far from what I've seen in the limited basis, I like where we're headed with him. I like what I see. All right, and if you want to hear the full clip, just go to GamecockCentral.com. Wes Mitchell has all of that up there for you. Let's talk about his position group because this is an interesting one. It was not necessarily a strength for South Carolina last year. Nothing about the defense was, but there was a lot of good development on that side of the ball. I think Keir Thomas had a nice year playing some tackle, moving out to end at times. You know, a young player. You also look at Rick Sandage and Jada and Ibarra getting their first action in the program. I think both had made major leaps Um, towards the end of the season, add a guy like Zach Pickens, and unfortunately you lose a guy like Josh Belk. So in talking to John Scott Jr. There you go. It's going to take a water break. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to do that for the rest of my life. In talking to John Scott Jr. and in the little bits of spring that you have gotten to see so far, how do you feel about the line heading into fall camp? Yeah, I think like he talked about today, it's really helped that some of the young guys have gotten to take reps because – you know, Javon Kinlaw is not out there, and he, he's actually he's very high on Javon Kinlaw, as you would you know expect him to be. But uh, a lot of these other young guys have gotten to play a lot. Um, you know, Keir Thomas has been banged up as well. And um, I don't know, Chris, you may know, where, do you know what the plan is going to be for Keir this year? I mean, still back and forth. It yeah, sounds they like. haven't, I'm not sure specifically. They haven't indicated, but, you know, he, he played some in last year. He played some tackle. And so there's been a few swing guys, and I think he would just figure to be – yeah, another you know, swing one of guy. those swing guys. Did you get a sense in talking to Coach Clark today that he likes to cross train guys? Yeah, I think that's going to be the plan with with a lot of guys. And they, you know, they they play so much three man versus four man, and a guy that is maybe um, an inside guy in a four man front may be a quote end in a three man front. So the fact they go back and forth a lot, I think, lends itself to some of these more versatile swing guys like Akira Thomas, Zach Pickens. He was, of course, asked about Zach today. Um, Zach has worked with him a lot, I, I think, when he's been able to be out there. Zach's still a little bit banged up, but he's uh, he's very high on him. And, I, uh, you know, I, I think this group ha- has a chance once they're completely healthy. You know, I, I think you look at uh, Javon Kinlaw being a sure starter, um, you know, DJ Wanham at the buck, which technically is not John Scott's spot. Uh, you know, he doesn't really work with those guys. But That's Mike Peterson working uh, with the Bucks that, still? Yeah, that's Mike Peterson. So you, you look at – but just looking at, you know, what a front might look like, um, I think past those two guys, though, you're going to have some, like, real battles. I, I think they're – you know, Enigbare moves back to defensive end. They're extremely high on him. You know, Keir Thomas, you'd imagine, is going to be playing somewhere. Like, he's going to be in the mix. Kobe Smith – Came on pretty strong last year. And then, you know, where exactly does Zach Pickens fit in? You know, is it truly a back-and-forth thing? Um, you know, I thought, listening to Wanham yesterday, he I can't remember the exact way he said it, but he sort of seemed to indicate Pickens had played inside a, a bunch so far, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. Well, we heard a little mm-hmm. bit, I guess it was when T-Rob was talking to the media about moving him inside and envisioning mm-hmm. him as as like a who's the, who's the comp? It wasn't Gerald McCoy. It was because he's a more traditional defensive tackle. Who is it for the Eagles? Fletcher Cox. Yeah, he yeah. made the comparison to Fletcher Cox and wanting to move him inside. Um, and you know, we see Will Muschamp cross train people at you know in the secondary, and we have seen Eric Wolford cross train people at the offensive line. So I guess I mean that's just the name of the game now. But it, it does it is interesting because it seems like both sides of the ball for Carolina, at least in the trenches, <coughs> are going to be very versatile. Because as as we both mentioned earlier. Kier Thomas playing inside and outside last year. J.J. Mm-hmm. Anigbari, who played inside last year, he's going to be playing more outside this year, but the way they're mixing up looks. And now you have Zach Pickens, who's as pure defensive end, just pass rushing talent as you're going to find, and even moving him inside. So I think that's just sort of the way that, that football is trending right now, having more versatility and just finding a way to get your best 11 guys on the field at all costs. But you know, do you all get any sense of, of how the players feel about that? Does Zach Pickens say... I'm a defensive end. I want to be lining up in a seven technique or a you know nine and just rushing the passer. Or do you get the sense that you know they're they're cool with it and they just want to 
do whatever is going to help the team. I think that I mean the roles were outlined, you know, during the recruiting process. I mean Zach knew he'd be a guy that could play inside and attack with an interior pass rush. He could play outside some, and um, so I think it's good. And then you either go to the other side of the ball, the offensive line, and talking to some of the players this week, they understand that something Eric Wolford's going to look for in the recruiting process is how many positions can you play. If you can play one, that's not good. If you can play guard and tackle, that's good. If you can play center and guard, that's good. Uh, if you can play all, four or five positions, that's great. And so they understand that, and it's also good for their future. You know, the more versatility you can show and what you can put on tape is also good, and that's why so many offensive linemen cross-train. Not only is it good for those guys, but it's good for the team because then it's about getting your best five at that position. And when you're on the defensive line, it's about getting your best three, your best four, your best five. I mean, they'll play some – the 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 depth as long as they stay healthy this year, year gives them more flexibility to play you know a three man front or a four man you play a 50 type front where you got three down linemen and sort of two guys out on the edge that's going to help them and and then on top of that Zach Pickens is a guy who can play some different roles and not really be pigeonholed into one different thing and they can keep fresher um that's something DJ Wanham talked about yesterday the fact that they have more depth they can go hundred percent every snap and know that you know somebody can come in behind them and play at a high level and they figure to have some more of that this season as long as they can stay healthy it's it's exciting and I haven't yet arrived at the point where I can just be unabashedly exciting about this defensive line because like I said you know it wasn't a great unit last year because no part of the defense was great last year and they had some injuries and they still had some young guys but I mean how do you guys feel are, are you allowing yourselves to get excited or are you still cautiously optimistic because again it, it wasn't great and it's a lot of the same personnel and you expect some guys to take a leap but are, are, are people getting ahead of themselves maybe I, I I think you can allow yourself to be a little bit excited because um for one is to me it's not the same personnel when you consider DJ Wanham was out for so long and he's such a difference maker and we saw him get to the quarterback against Tennessee and and go make some plays and and stuff like that, and I, I think that, um, you know, you look at a healthier Javon Kinlaw, potentially, you add Zach Pickens, um, Enigbare play in maybe maybe his more natural position, a year sure. older, Kier Thomas. Um, I mean, shoot, look, think about, to me, I start to think about who all could you get on the field at the same time, and, you know, if, if Pickens is more of an inside guy, then maybe you're talking about Wanham at Buck, Ken Law, it's sort of a nose, one technique, Pickens at like a three technique, and then a sophomore in Igbare as your defensive end. I mean, that's four pretty talented guys. If, you know, if Pickens is more of an end, then, you know, I think him and Igbare are probably fighting it out. Um, and then you're talking about maybe a veteran, Kobe Smith, as the other defensive tackle, or um, Kier Thomas as the other defensive tackle, maybe even depending on the matchup. And, and we totally facing. left out Rick Sandich, who I thought was yeah. awesome at time yeah, last year. Yeah, and, and we and Sam, talked about Aaron Sterling mm-hmm. at yeah, all. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to pick Brad. four, basically. Yeah, And then yeah. you fill in the blanks you know, after that for the next four. Yeah. Um, I mean, Rick, Rick's going to be in the – I mean, I, I think the starting – maybe we haven't talked about it that much, but who starts – Alongside Ken Law is like that other quote inside guy. It's like four um, guys you could put there that, right now, and I wouldn't call you crazy. That may be one of the most least talked about, but most like highly battled, I guess, spot um, because so many guys could fit in, and and some of it's going to depend on uh, like we've talked about um, matchup. Who are you facing that week? And uh, you know what formation are you in? Are you a three man, four man? Um, is this like a a power run? team you're facing you know in those situations maybe maybe it's Kobe Smith and Javon Kinlaw plugging up the middle but if this is more of a spread team maybe Zach Pickens is in there alongside Kinlaw as y'all know we don't get to see a a whole bunch of spring and even the spring game won't tell us a lot because it's you know a different kind of different kind of experiment but I will be very curious to see just what the units they run out there are because again it's not going to be full speed it's not going to be really complex you know offensive looks that they're getting but just to see who is lining up where I think is going to be really really interesting one of the things that I'm most looking forward to uh from the spring game just uh just under a month away now I guess right isn't it like April April 6th April 6th yeah April 6th so just under a month away certainly looking forward to seeing how the defensive line plays out other things we've, we've heard from several assistants now it's been about a week of practice what have you guys seen or heard last week we went through some of our top storylines and the things we were looking for obviously interested in Helensky, interested in what Zach Pickens would look like what have you guys picked up in the last week or so that has been of interest either something that a coach has said or something you've seen in practice I think um 
you know, a couple interesting things um, at running back. You know, that, that's been sort of – that's one of those storylines, Pearson, that we talked about where, you know, sort of how is that going to shake out? And, and really there's not an answer, not that we expected one. It may not be until preseason or even, heck, even the first game. But, you know, spring gives you some time to sort those things out and see how guys develop. Um, Rico Dowdle has been still limited in practice, and so that's given, you know, Mon Denson, Deshaun Fenwick, Kevin Harris. Those have been guys with A.J. Turner still on defense. Uh, they've really been shouldering the load there. And uh, we've learned that Kevin Harris has done a really nice job. I mean, he, he's a guy that has impressed asking some of the players during the media availability. He's been a player that's really come up a lot. You know, when you ask, a, ask the players which offensive guys have stood out. He's big. He's powerful. Got a big lower body. He's an extremely hard worker. So I think his presence has sort of pushed some of the other backs. And then A.J. Turner yesterday, even though, you know, he's at DB, had a lot of great things to say about Deshaun Fenwick. He said from from this time last year to this time, the same time this year, he's he just looks like a completely different guy because he's really, I think, he's sort of bought in, taking coaching, his work ethic's a lot better, and he's running harder. And so I think that was sort of a couple encouraging signs maybe about the running back room. You know, I, I think uh, I go to the DBs, and, you know, it might – partially just be fresh on our mind but I'm very curious to see how that group plays out because I I think you're you are still especially until the freshmen get here you're you're still kind of thin there but um man they're they could put a lot of talent on the field and I'm curious to see how it plays out at this nickelback position um they want to play JC Horn outside at corner and you know with Israel McCormu and JC Horn as your starting corners like I I think, and I know they're both sophomores, but you're in pretty good shape there. Mm-hmm. You have size on the edge. You know, Muschamp keeps talking about stopping the run and how the perimeter screen game, which they include as as the running game as far as defense goes. Um, I think those two things go hand in hand when he's saying they have to be better on the perimeter and they want to put a guy like J.C. Horn on the perimeter. And J.C. Horn's Carolina's best corner, and it's not close. I mean, he's as yeah. good as, I mean... In terms of talent, you probably have to go back to Stephon Gilmore to find someone with just that kind of ability to be a lockdown cover corner on the other side. Mukwamu, who you know got a little more action as the year went on, just because of injuries, he's massive. He's he's listed as six four and like is really every bit of that six four. He's really long. And one of the things that I've heard, I don't remember if it was Travis Robinson or one of the other players saying, uh, just you know his comfort, you know, his his speed, his agility, especially with his hips, because that's one thing that you look at when guys are that tall, they don't necessarily move laterally as quickly as you would like a corner to, which is why you don't see a lot of six four corners. But if mm. Mukwamu has, you know, improved some of that lateral um, agility, improved his hips and things like that, that's something I'm excited for. But that nickel that you were mentioning, is the staff just that committed at having Jamias Williams at safety? Because I thought as a freshman, he was really, really solid at that nickel back. They tried to move him at safety last year. He ended up playing a little bit of nickel, got hurt again. I, I feel like he's the natural guy to fill in that role, right? Well, he he's going to be in the mix, um, and there's several guys in the mix. I get the feeling they just they want more size near the line of scrimmage, and um, Jamias is certainly going to be in the conversation there. Um, the new interesting guy that's going to be in the conversation is R.J. Roger. You know, I, I think um, mostly played safety last year. Mostly played strong safety last year. Yeah, right? played um, only safety. I I don't think did he work in at nickel at all last don't year. I don't think, think so. he did. Nah. So, and, and he, you know, you know, R.J. spoke uh, earlier this week, and he was very. Candid, he said. He said, "A, I, I really like playing nickel because I'm close to the line of scrimmage. B, I, I need to keep studying. Like I, you know, I've got a lot to still learn about it." And he said he thinks what he needs to learn is is just going to take time in the quote classroom, like in the meeting room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because um, the physicality is no problem for him. We saw him lay the yeah. wood on multiple occasions last year. Likes to hit people, and uh, so you know, could RJ take that spot? And then the question becomes, okay, who sort of fills in behind him? At, at safety if he's having to play nickel and um you know I, I think in some cases maybe maybe when you're in the 4-3 RJ is, is a safety and then when you go to nickel he comes down and you then if, if you're committed to Jemias at safety you know maybe Jemias slides in at safety I, I I'm very intrigued by Jamel Cook because I think when you're talking about continuing I think it's at the point where South Carolina needs to be able to put quote SEC sized guys in their lineup, basically all 11 in the starting, you know, lineup on defense. And when I look at Jamel Cook physically, I say that guy looks like it's supposed to look. Sure. Um, so I, I think he's maybe, what would you say, like an X factor. If if he could have a great spring and then a great offseason and take a spot 
at safety, I think that helps a, a number of different situations. I know it's hard to say right now. Where do you think Jimmy Robinson factors into this? You think they'll try and put him at the nickel, nickel or nickel? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I, I think long term, you know, he he could be a nickel or a safety, but um, you know, he they they actually have said he and Shiloh Sanders will get a look at nickel when they get here. And R.J. Roderick just um, literally started smiling when talking about what Jamie Robinson's game sort of brings to the table. Um, so I, I think they're they're kind of similar mindseted guys. Uh, you know, Jamie's a kid that'll hit you and then tell you about it. And um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Jamie Robinson. You know, by the end of the year, that that guy might be your starting nickel, and, and maybe not even by the end. You know, maybe fairly early. So, and all, all those freshmen, I feel like, um, you know, whether it's at nickel or, you know, who, who's going to be the backup cornerbacks? You know, I think those freshmen are going to have to just come in and play, and you're. You're going to have some young guys in there, but you're also going to be pretty talented there, I think. feels like maybe where the defensive line was last year, because last year we were looking at a group with Sandage, with Enigbaro, with Josh Belk, who we know is no longer with the program, but you look at the line last year and you're like, there's a lot of talent here, there's a lot of potential, but probably one year away. feels like this is the class where you have a lot of talent on the you know, on this defensive backfield, and it's just a matter of, of getting some of those guys reps. And I guess the good part of them being thin is they're going to get the reps early, they're going to get mm-hmm. the reps often, so by the end of the season, hopefully they're not going to be freshmen for the ones that are freshmen but you just hope that in the meantime it's not too ugly as they get accustomed to the game yeah and, and physically I think a little bit easier to play um corner than it is you know inside on the defensive line yeah, the farther or away like from the ball yeah it isn't isn't that the same the farther that, the farther away say. that you are Especially from the ball physically yeah except for safety you well that, I think that's more <laughs> mentally that's a mental thing yeah yeah I mean it's very difficult in must champs defense to play safety very difficult I mean there's there's just a lot on you yeah I mean you're talking about certain Certain packages where they're they're literally the the say the nickel's job is or the linebacker's job is to funnel guys to the middle of the field to the safety who's sort of patrolling there and so that mentally there's a lot on on these guys and so that you guys are right I mean easier to go out there and just play corner and say that's why they could stick AJ Turner in the bowl game and say look to the sideline we'll sort of tell you what to do just go out there and cover somebody or try to yeah we didn't even mention him when we were talking about nickel aj turner's training over there for a reason they at least see something from it you know if they didn't think that he could reasonably play the position they just let him go back to running back this is more natural position but he has at least shown something that makes him think he could at least be a body back there yeah i mean he could be and um you know nobody really knows yet how it's going to play out i mean he's got another practice i guess at uh at, at defensive back before he moves back to running back. Um, but they wanted to get him up to speed, and he's more comfortable now. And so it sort of remains to be seen if he'll play r- just running back or if he'll play just defensive back or if he'll sort of go back and forth between both. Uh, he could, like you said, reasonably help out at both, even as a, if, as a two-way player. He's obviously comfortable with the offense. He's comfortable. He'll be on every special team. And that's so, what he wants to do, right? Yeah, like he, yeah he would to, like to be a two-way player, but it just... Uh, I think he yeah, wants it's, to... It's not 1965 Not anymore. come off the field yeah, ever. That, he literally, yeah. I think, wants to be the first guy in modern South Carolina football <laughs> to just go offense, then special teams, then defense, like back-to-back-to-back. To back to back, we I have think. some great yeah. stat people on Gamecock Central on the on the boards, I'm sure. Yeah, or at least do. people that are good researchers. So yeah. I want to know, unless either one of you knows right now, but for I'm those of sure you listening, who was the last Gamecock player to play two ways... For an entire season, that's, oh, that's a good know. one. That's what I want to know. Somebody, somebody will have to effort that for us. Like an side. entire season, yeah. And not that they had to play every game or play, you know, five thousand snaps a game, but just like actually had two positions who's, that they played. Who's even the last guy to play like DB and like receiver in the same game? Just one game. I don't even know the answer to that. I mean, all right, so I don't know. Gil- Gilmore playing DB and then quarterback, Wildcat quarterback, quarterback. Yeah. Wildcat quarterback. Um, that was one. Yep, but that wasn't really his position. You know, he wasn't listed on the depth chart as a quarterback. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. to find somebody that's actually listed that's what I'm both saying. ways is, I mean, somebody, somebody that's going to listen to this will know. And, I mean, you've had guys within the course of a season. I mean, Savelle played like, yeah, played a bunch of receivers, running back, and then, and but then not in the same season. season. And then next, yeah, he did in the same season. In the same yeah. season, yeah, Savelle. He switched so, to quarterback. He, he was playing defensive back, and then he switched to quarterback, right? Savelle, no, Savelle, Savelle moved to. I feel like Savell was on offense in 2006, and then didn't he start at safety in the swamp, um, the block field goal <laughs> game? I think that's right. So the same, but, so the same season, but not in the same game because he wasn't playing quarterback that game. No, not this is the same season, not the right. same game. Right. Okay. Yeah, but I, I need I need same game over the course of an entire season or most of a season. 
Anyway, somebody will get that for us. But that, I don't know if that exists in mo- in modern. No, no, that's what I'm saying. But you have to go back to like 1965. But I'm telling you, like somebody's going to know. Though. If we go downstairs, well, Tommy Moody's not here, but I'll ask Tommy Moody tomorrow <laughs> Tommy morning, Moody will and he'll know, know. And, he'll, off, and he'll tell me his off, exact stats, yeah. offensive and defensive, and his birthday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. his favorite ice cream. <laughs> yeah, Gamecocks <laughs> have one more practice before they get to spring break, and then on the other side, as you mentioned, AJ Turner is going to be back to playing offense. Uh, Chandler Farrell is going to be moving. Uh, to right guard, he's been working a lot at center. I guess that means hopefully Hank Manis will be back and working um, at center at that point. They uh, said they hope to maybe have him today. today. We today. obviously Thursday. don't know um, if they did or not, but definitely by after spring break. So a couple of things switching around as they uh, lead back up to the spring game. What are you looking for for this back half of spring practice that is sort of an unanswered question that you didn't get any answers for this first five, six practices? Uh, that's a good question. Um I mean, I, to keep it right where you're at, I, I think they're still working through some things on the offensive line. Um, I was maybe most surprised by the fact that it sounds like Cedarius Hutcherson is the left tackle. Yeah, um, I was surprised at how quickly they were just like, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I, it he's was, the guy. It was, he's working there, and then it's like, no, 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 he's left tackle. So right now it looks like Cedarius Hutcherson, from left to right, Cedarius Hutcherson, Donnell Stanley, seems like they would like to go and, with Hank Manos, and then Chandler Farrell at the right guard and well, keeping Dylan Bonham at right tackle. Well, see, I, I think that... Right guard's open. I, mean, I think Eric Jordan Douglas. Rhodes um, is still heavily in the mix at right guard. I think that um, Eric Douglas, who is now getting snaps at center as well, um, you know, I, I think from what Wolf said, you know, the other day, Douglas was his starting center and Jordan Rhodes was his starting right guard. And then Douglas is going to get cross trained at left tackle towards the end of spring yeah, too, which I, so he's going to play a bunch of. Yeah, spots. and I think I think Douglas at left tackle is more emergency, like emergency, because yeah. he wants to have four guys at each spot. That not necessarily that hey, you know, we feel great about all four of these guys at each spot, but at least you have some experience. If it just yeah, and I mean right guard's got what four guys who could realistically. Mm-hmm. End up being the guy before the season, not even exiting the spring, but it could be like Douglas has been more consistent. Jordan Rhodes is probably the more talented more player. Yeah, yeah, the more powerful a little player, more size. Um, and, and and so you got those two, and then Farrell could play it. Um, Hank Manos could play it, really. Yeah. Um, he'll he'll get some work at guard, and then you got Gwen too. So it's going to be interesting. And all this one. talk on both trenches, and despite the fact that your four-second clip of Ryan Hunsky throwing a football into a net, getting like 15 billion views or whatever it ended up being, yes, no talk of the quarterback, really. I mean, other than projecting some confidence into on Joyner and Jake mm-hmm. Bentley saying that he's going to take these guys under his wing, which is exactly what you expect him to say, no real developments there. Does that surprise you? Does that concern you? No, because I, I, don't, I don't know if what we say necessarily, I mean... I think it's perception versus reality. Like there, I mean, I'm sure there's development at the quarterback position. But aren't you surprised that not like one guy hasn't just been like, "Oh man, Helensky threw this ball today," and then we jump on it and write ten stories about it? <laughs> but I, I, I haven't heard anything like that. It's, oh yeah, Dakaron Joyner is the number two guy. He's been good, and haven't heard anything about Helensky. Yeah, I think, and I think they're purposely sort of doing that. But you know, the players, the players are sort of wise to. They're burying the lead. So not, that well, they don't, they're, they're the not going to come Holinsky out. He's the starting quarterback. <laughs> Everyone will be taken by they're, surprise. They're not going to say a ton. I mean, some guys are more candid than others. Um, you know, and they have been giving, um, you know, Holinsky and Joyner and Yuri, they've, they've been letting those guys step up and say, play with the ones and, and things like that just to get them some reps. I guess it's just, you can, you could probably more chalk it up to it's, it's still fairly early in spring and, and we have had some people tell us, you know, this guy looks good. He, he's done some good things, but I just don't know. It's still sort of early for like some huge movement. Well, well I mean, I don't need a movement. I just want to hear something about him. He's still, first of all, learning everything right mm-hmm. now. Yeah, and I, I don't think Kalinsky um, is that guy. He's not that guy that you're just going to look at and be like. Oh my God, that's the strongest arm I've ever seen in my entire life. Like that—that's not his game. Like he has a strong enough arm. Um, you know, he's an accurate kid, but I, I think his game is more, uh, you know, something that's going to play out over time. Where you know, you look at his knowledge of the game, and he's a student of the game, and that's something that I think, as time goes on, you know, we'll start to see play out. And, and I've I've heard some good things about the carry on Jorner. You know, I, somebody told me last week, like don't don't forget about Jorner. Like this kid. Um, when he's in there, he he can move the offense. There were times last year as a true freshman in practice where I was told he 
you know, went up and down the field with the first team offense. Like he, it doesn't look the same as if you know Jake Bentley's doing it. It's a different style, but you know, don't just completely mm-hmm. forget about the kid. And I, I think, um, you know, I think you've talked about it, Chris. Like um, the idea of you know, is this the year where you have to try to get the ball in his hands? some way even if it's just situationally i think or just let him be debo basically you know just have another playmaker on the field debo wasn't as much of a threat to throw it but where debo would maybe you know take more wildcat snaps that's a more traditional quarterback look and you just have the extra sort of variable maybe you put him at wide receiver have the threat of a throwback and then you toss him some jet sweeps you know do handoffs he's he's a real weapon and 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 as much as i'm you know having fun with the holinsky thing here just trying to concern troll i think it is you know a good sign i think it would probably be more worrisome was it especially for Jones. Concern troll? Concern troll. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just like learn something new from yeah. yeah. Just young just guys. just like that was amazing. Basically getting people worked up. You know, okay. it's it's just a, a specific <laughs> type of trolling where you're like, Oh, I'm really worried about this because you know, just But I I I think it would not portend well for Carolina if it was like, Oh, you know, Holinsky came in and he's number two right there. Because yeah. I, I think it's I think it's ultimately a good thing that what we're seeing is to carry on Joyner has you know, taking a step, he continues to progress, and that this new guy, who as talented as he is, has had five practices mm-hmm. under his belt, and like you mentioned, is still going you know, to take him a while for him to learn the entire offense. I think it's a, a very good thing that that he's not go ahead and taking that uh, that number two role away from DeCaran Joiner. We have a couple weeks, just under a month, three weeks. Just under four weeks until the spring game. We'll have a couple more, another Carolina podcast before that, including the one that I'm very excited about. We're going to do this. We're going to go through the all time. Spring Kings. That's what we're going to call okay. it. The guys that have just totally nice. balled out in spring practice. And, I, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to I'll have to discuss this with our executive producer, Wesley. Um, I don't know how, like, mean we want to be about it. Not that it would ever be mean-spirited, but I don't know if we want to limit this to guys that were awesome in spring yeah. and then never did anything else or if it's just guys that had great springs regardless of how the rest of their careers panned out. So we'll, we'll have that for you uh, at some point before the spring game. But thanks, as always, for oh, tuning we in. we got a uh, – hold on. I'm oh, going to cut you off. Do it. Do it. This is EP, your show. Stepping in. Two We're, plugs. Yeah. This is an exclusive, as we call it in the business. Um, Pearson, if anyone listening to our podcast from now on wants to get on Gamecock Central with a 30 day free trial, this is not offered anywhere else. We're only mentioning it on the podcast just to see what that is. It's kind of an experiment, I guess. GC Pod. So if you go sign up, just type that into the code and you get 30 days free. To Gamecock Central, so if you you have to put in a credit card, we're gonna be completely upfront, honest. Like if if you don't cancel within the thirty days, you will be charged. Um, and it's nine ninety five if you do it per month. It's ninety nine ninety five if you do it annually. So um, if you want to try us without paying for it, just cancel before the thirty days are up, and you'll never be charged a single cent. But uh, after the thirty days are up, it will charge you. But we want to give people who listen but maybe have not been on the site and checked out some of our premium stuff gc pod gc pod gc pod pod um what else do you need to push and the easiest way you know you can go you can sign up directly on gamecockcentral.com but if you've already heard enough you can just go to join.gamecockcentral.com that's another way perfect i mean look at that then you have to find the or look in the upper right hand corner gamecockcentral.com that's right and you can go to that and you know and of course like wes said you can cancel i don't think you'll want to because you'll fall in love with wes daily and his uh musings on the program and inside info and you can post all sorts of nasty stuff on the boards about us if you don't like it mainly about piercing yeah but that's right i love those are my favorite threads. did you see that thread i had to delete i didn't I'm, Did you really? No, I'm, I'm kidding. I was going to say, it wouldn't surprise me. It's probably been some. I, I, I like to get on there and, and, and respond to people. I, I find that people are like, oh, yeah, he's the worst. And then I'm like, hey, why do you think I'm the worst? They're like, oh, no, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> how it normally goes. They don't, you know? don't want to say it to your face. Yeah. No, it's just okay. If people think I'm, there are a lot of people I'm sure that think I'm the worst and they're entitled <laughs> to that opinion. I think they think you're like the worst. Uh, some people ever. probably do. <laughs> I, 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 if, if the three letters N, B, and A happened to spill out of my lips at any point during the show in that order, well, I'm people lose their them. collective yeah. lens. Chris and I yes. spent the entire local show today talking about LeBron pretty much. It was we fantastic. Did. We did. What, what else? So the before last, we forget. <laughs> before we forget, yeah, I get off track. So the other thing we have, we have a newsletter, and it is daily, and this is free. So people like the Gamecocks, <laughs> free stuff. Pitch. It's daily. And it's, it's daily free. and it's free. It's Monday through, now not every day. Give us a little bit break. Monday through Friday. They get weekends too. Yeah, it's called Gamecock Nation Today, and it is a newsletter. It will be dropped directly in your inbox if you sign up for it. 
Um, basically, it's going to have all sorts of Gamecock info every day, Monday through Friday. It comes early in the morning, so you can catch up on everything. It's a one-stop shop. It's been endorsed by the greatest figures in Gamecock history. Um, Stephen Garcia? Steve Fink. Steve Fink. Oh, Fink. I, I thought you were going with the other Steve I hope Garcia. we don't get in trouble for mentioning that, but he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Subscribe <laughs> to the so gamecockcentral dot com slash newsletters. Subscribe you to the newsletter, and if you want a thirty day free trial to Gamecock Central, GC Pod is the code to do that. And as always, if you enjoy the pod, leave us a rating and review. Let us know how you really feel, and of course, share with your friends. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we will be back again next week with another Carolina podcast.